recording. Um, okay, so, so the reason we're holding this webinar is an opportunity for everybody who would like to apply for the Resilient Green Spaces Food Hubs project to ask us questions, basically. Um, we've got representatives from the Open Food Network, Social Farms and Garden, um, Deve Development Trust Association Wales, um, and we are the partner organisations who are um, very excited to be running this project. Um, so the, the, the project is funded by the Welsh Government, um, which Anne-Marie will go into in more detail. Um, but yes, this is just a session um, we're, we're hoping to wrap up at, by, by about 11 a.m. Um, where you can just ask us any questions. And the, the format of this session will be, um, we will do a couple of very short presentations. I mean, all of the information is on the website, which we encourage you to go and have a look at. Um, so, um, Anne-Marie is going to give, who is from Social Farms and Gardens, will give us a quick um, run through of the, of the wider Resilient Green Spaces project, of which this is just one work stream. Um, then Nick Weir from OFN, Open Food Network, sorry, um, will talk about the actual Food Hubs project in more detail. Um, so that should only take us about 10 minutes. While that's happening, if you're able to multitask, if you're able to listen and type, that would be fantastic because if you could please put any questions you have into the chat. Um, we have also got Tanya Edwards from um, Development Trust Association Wales and Tanya will be collecting all of those questions um, and sort of fielding them to the team. Um, we know not everybody likes using chat on Zoom. So if you would like to ask a question or chip in or say anything, um, you can just use the raise your hand function um, on Zoom. If that doesn't work, just raise your hand in real life and I'm sure Tanya will see you. Um, okay, bit of housekeeping. We are recording this. I hope that's okay. If anybody's not able to make this session, we're hoping that we're gonna be able to share this, um, put it on our website so others can watch it. Um, please keep yourself on mute unless you are speaking. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything. So I will pass over to uh, Marie from Social Farms and Gardens to tell you a bit more about the project. Hello everyone, I'm Anne-Marie. Um, I'm the project coordinator for Resilient Green Spaces at Social Farms and Gardens. I've not got a presentation, it's just me talking, but I have put my email address and a link to the uh, Resilient Green Spaces page on the Social Farms and Gardens website into the chat. Um, if you wanted to, to go and have a look or to email me with any further questions about Resilient Green Spaces. We just really wanted to give you a bit of context as to that. Food Hub sits within the Resilient Green Spaces project. Um, so I'll try and be brief. Um, so Resilient Green Spaces is a 1.27 million pound project that's pan Wales, it's totally across Wales. There are six work streams, allotments, food hubs, which is why we're all here today, orchards, uh, greener verges and corridors, uh, community access to farms and land, and uh, horticultural skills development. So in, within the allotments work stream, that's being led by social farms and gardens. And we're looking at regenerating and creating um, up to around 600 new allotment plots across Wales, um, working with private landowners and community groups to populate those allotment plots. Uh, within food hubs, that's why we're here today. I won't say any more on that. I'll let Nick do that. Um, within uh, orchards, we are looking to plant uh, around a thousand trees. Um, applications for that have just gone live, just. Um, so information on that on the um, Social Farms and Gardens Resilient Green Spaces website. So yeah, working with community groups to plant around a hundred trees um, across 10 different sites, geographically spread across Wales. Um, Greener Verges and Corridors is working specifically with Gwynedd Council and linking local community groups to their Greener Verges and working up um, new cutting regimes and biodiversity plans um, to, to develop um, biodiversity in those Greener Corridors across Gwynedd. Um, there's community access to farms and gardens, um, a, a lot of new entrants coming into uh, uh, horticulture, farming, uh, and a big issue is access to land. And so that particular work stream is mainly around desk research and is looking at how 
um, how private local authority landowners may wish to look at how their land could be used, particularly given new farming subsidies, working with community groups and community managed spaces. So we'll be looking at how that develops, what the issues and opportunities and barriers are and creating a piece of research around that. And fingers crossed, potentially buying some land as part of that work stream later on down the line um, and linking a community group to it to show best practice. And then the final work stream is uh, working with uh, Lantra and the Land Workers Alliance and um, looking at new horticultural, agroecological skills for new ent entrants into horticulture. So looking at um, uh, farming skills, so it, looking at cropping and planting and rotation um, and also building in tractor skills. Um, so there's a new curriculum being worked up by Lantra um, and piloted with, with different uh, farmer growers across Wales. I should also say that allotments is being led by social farms and gardens, food hubs obviously by Open Food Network and Development Trust Association Wales. Um, Orchards is also being led by social farms and gardens as is greener corridors and verges. Community access to farms and land is shared assets and land workers alliance leading and the community uh, building horticultural skills is, is Lantra and Land Workers Alliance. So there's six streams of work that all benefit and complement each other. What we are hoping is that later on down the line, particularly with the food hubs, is that there'll be some synergies with the orchards and allotments, whereby some of those producers may be able to feed into some of the food hubs, depending on selections and geographic locations and so on. But that would be um, an aspiration. Nick's just started screen sharing, which is at quite a good point. <laughs> um, if there's no particular further questions, that's just to show you how it sits in with, with the rest of the project. As I say, my email's in the, in the chat, so's the access to the web page. Do email me, quite happy to answer any, uh, any questions or pass you over to any of my colleagues if any other social farms and gardens work might be more appropriate. I'm really sorry, Anne Marie. I was fiddling, and I'm I'm very nervous at the beginning of a webinar, and I was fiddling with buttons, and I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Nick Weir, Open Food Network, and I would like to share my screen now. And I will now press my screen share button at the appropriate time. Um, the Open Food Network is a global community of farmers and growers and community food enterprises and software geeks around the world who believe that the food system is broken and that we need to rebuild the food system from the bottom up. What we're looking at now is, is the map of the Open Food Network in the UK. Um, as I say, it's a global community. So there are maps like this in 20 countries around the world with a lot of other countries in the process of setting up. Um, we share a common code base. We've, we've collectively, over the last eight years, we've, we've written a bit of software and it's a work in progress. It's constantly evolving. But that software enables farmers and growers to get their food as, to eaters and buyers using short food supply chains so that we, we make it as accessible as possible so, so that people who are growing the food can get the food to the people who need to eat it as, as simply as possible. So the map you're seeing has got tractors on it and it's got shop symbols on it. Uh, the tractors are pretty self-explanatory. It's anybody who's producing food. They don't need to use a tractor. If they want to make jam, then obviously they don't use a tractor. Sorry, I'm in a bit of a weird mood this morning. Um, and the shops, in some cases, are farms. They're, they may be farms that are selling direct to the public, or they may be uh, a food hub, like the one I'm about to show you, um, which is a collection of, of different producers who are selling through a single shop front. They might be food banks, they might be buying groups, they might be food co-ops, buying from wholesalers and splitting sacks of produce and, and selling it on. Um, what we've done with the software is to try and enable as many different uh, permutations of um, how to get food to people as simply as possible. So we're not being prescriptive about what a food hub is, and I'll, I will talk about a bit of, in, in a moment about some different models. Um, but what we're trying to do is to enable local communities to build whatever they think they need in their local area to make a resilient food system in their area that has direct contacts with the people who are producing the food. Um, 
on the same. So we're looking at the Open Food Network, um, openfoodnetwork.org.uk. Uh, within that, there are various other tabs. I'm going to take you now to the to the shops tab, which is the buy food tab. But this is where all the different hubs are. Have a look at these later. Um, but there's there's hubs all the way across the UK, um, and they're all different. Every single food hub is different. Um, what they have in common is that they sell produce from local producers to local people. In some cases, multiple producers working together through a single shop front. Um, and they all use the Open Food Network platform, which means that they can link together. That word network in, in our name means that the software encourages people to network with each other so that if somebody is using the Open Food Network in one particular way, they have the option to, to link with everybody else who's using the Open Food Network and they can start to sell each other's produce, distribute each other's produce, move each other's produce around and so on. Now, one of the food hubs in on this list is the one that I've been part of for the last, oh God, 13, 14 years. Um, we don't use the Open Food Network as the front end. We have our own front end. Uh, this is a WordPress site and it's got loads of stuff about our values and about you know, what we do and, and why we do it. Um, it's got loads of stuff on uh, the different profiles of our different producers and all that sort of stuff. Um, but if you go to the shop tab within our WordPress site, that takes you to the Open Food Network that sits behind all of the hubs in the, in the UK. We have a we choose to land people at the notices page because there's loads of COVID stuff on our notices page. But some hubs will take people directly to their shop tab. And the shop is a pretty standard e-commerce system with, with a few differences. Um, you can filter by the type of product and by the properties. I'm going to way too much detail here. I just love the software. Um, one of the big things that we're really into is transparency. Apologies for any vegans on the call. I shouldn't have clicked on the meat. Um, but uh, we put a product description up. The producers put a very detailed description of the product and, and, and how it's reared. If the shopper wants to know more about who is the producer, they can click on the, the producer tab and it tells you exactly who is the producer. It gives you lots of contact details so you can talk directly to them. And the other thing about transparency is that against every price on the Open Food Network, you can click a little pie chart and it will tell you exactly how much of that selling price is going to the producer and how much is going to the hub. All the hubs, I think that's true to say, most of the hubs on, in the UK will be making a markup. So they will, they will be selling producers products and then they will add a markup to cover their running costs. So the costs of um, maybe hiring a, a church hall to distribute from, um, maybe the, the cost of the, the people who are running the food hub to pay them a salary. Um, and, and that is the markup and, and the shoppers can see how big that markup is. Um, let me talk briefly about different types of food hubs. Um, so the one we've got in Stroud, we have a church hall, which we hire on a Friday morning, uh, just for a few hours. Um, apart from that, it's a virtual organization. It's, it's all online. Uh, we've got 85 different producers selling a whole range of different produce locally. Uh, we also do buy in some produce from a wholesaler in Bristol. Um, so, so things like um, pasta and rice and so on, we buy in. Um, and then the shoppers can browse and, and place orders and the software then sends a purchase order to each producer. They then harvest the produce. Um, they get a 36 hour notice to harvest their produce, get it to the church hall on a Friday morning. We bag it up and send it out to various pickup points. Some people come to the church hall to pick up and we have a, a bike delivery service um, distributing the boxes. Um, other hubs might be based on a, um, <clears throat> a high street shop. So there are some food hubs in the UK that are um, a standard shop front, uh, you know, a retail shop front in a, a town or a village. And they use the Open Food Network as an online supplement to their, to their shop. Um, and so they will be linking with local producers. They will sell the, the other produce online. The producers will deliver it to the shop and then the, the shoppers will come to the shop and pick up the pre-ordered boxes and then buy other stuff from the shop as well. Um, some food hubs are buying groups. They buy it from wholesalers and split you know, 25 kilo sacks of rice and split it into smaller quantities, but they're buying at wholesale prices. So they keep costs down. 
Um, I've gone way over time. I'm really sorry. Uh, Joe, what else should I have been talking about with this project? Um, I should have been talking about the fact that we're going to be supporting food hubs to, um, to set up. We'll be giving food hubs a small amount of capital budget, a very small amount. So if you need to buy a fridge or a freezer to, to set up your food hub, we can, we can help you buy that. Uh, if you might need to buy boxes and bags and table, foldable tables and that sort of thing, we can help with that. Uh, we'll also be paying a salary to a, a, a 0.5 FTE, so two and a half days a week uh, salary to the food hub manager over the period of the funding up to June 2023 uh, to cover the, the salary of the of the of the worker. Um, what else have I missed, Joe? I don't think you've missed anything. I think let's maybe see if people have got questions, and we will probably need to give more information at that point, if that's okay. Um, I just wondered if, if Peter, if you wanted to say anything at all from Development Trust Association Wales point of view, we haven't planned for this, you don't have to, but I just wondered if there's anything you wanted to add. Well, just to say, we're also looking for sort of like innovative enterprise in food hubs. I mean, Nick's touched on the fact that they're all trading, you know, that's one of the, the uses of the on, online platform is to access to trading, but there's a million different entry points to this. There's no one fixed fixed way, but we are looking for the potential for local food hubs, uh, whenever they start, or they're already existing organizations wanting to develop a food hub, to add value to that by linking with other producers, uh, you know, food distributors in the area, and looking to bring in a number of other stakeholders, potentially scale up and grow in the future. So it's looking how you make, can, you know, Often food hubs start with volunteers as their base, you know, and it's a quite a co common way, but, you know, the potential to employ people to create other income streams, add value to other community enterprises in the area is something we're particularly interested in uh, from our point of view and how you sustain and manage the food hub into the future. So I think, I think that's the main things, Joe. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Um... Does anybody have any questions for us, either on what the project is, how we will be supporting you, or what the application process is? Um, please, as I say, raise your hands or put your answer into the chat. Dawn. Um, just on the point about the salary, I'm just wondering whether the um, Stroud project actually covers that salary now. If, if you're paying a salary two and a half days a week, um, yeah. let's try to have a two and a half day a week work and are they able to cover the salary? Yes, they are. Yes, they okay. cover the worker's salary. They also pay, um, so we have bike couriers and drivers and they, they are also paid from the okay. costs of the food hub. Yeah. yeah. Is that, do you charge kind of transport costs on top of the yes. food costs? Yeah, okay. so if people pick up from the church hall, it's free. Some of the pickup points are free, uh, but home delivery uh, we charge based on how far away from the food hub they are. Yeah. Okay. And, and it, that, would, that, it, that, it would be good to look at that project in more detail as we construct, because obviously you've got experience, yeah. and as we construct in something, yeah. I'm sure we could learn a lot. And that is one of the things that the project will also provide is access to all of the trading food hubs in the UK. Uh, you, we have within the Open Food Network uh, a programme called Thriving Food Hubs, which is a, a regular weekly um, session where we, we look at what's going on with, with some of the successful food hubs around the UK. And we'll be asking all of the people who go through this programme um, if they'd like to contact with a, a similar hub that's already trading so you've got a bit of mentoring a bit of support um, okay thank you joe there's a, an, a, a hand raised by andrea sanders yep go ahead andrea hi um i'm actually in a very rural part of wales where broadband is an issue um i've actually spoken to a lot of farmers as part of some research i was doing and um i wondered if anybody could come out or has any experience in how to deal with this because one of the re i've spoken to farmers about 
selling locally and joining food hubs and so on. And this is one of the issues they have is access to broadband to link in with, with something like the Open Food Network. And um, if you've encountered this, how, how have you overcome it? It's a really good question. And it came up a lot during lockdown when a lot of the people who were using the Open Food Network were elderly, a lot of the shoppers were elderly or, or um, self-isolating and, and didn't want to use the internet or didn't have access to the internet. So a lot of food hubs are now trading with the option for both the shoppers and the producers to, 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 to sell by, by phone. So it's, it's more administratively demanding for the hub. But what the hub would do is they would phone the producers each week, they would check what produce they've got available, and then the hub would do the administration of stock levels and preparing the produce for sale. And the hub could also offer a phone buddy service to any shoppers who didn't have internet access, and then the shopper could actually phone in. If you are going to work that way, you do need to bear in mind that that is more time consuming. You might be able to find volunteers who can do some of that work, but you know, you, if, if you're going to be paying people to do that, you do need to build that into your markup that you make on the selling price of, of the food hub. Thank you. Can I ask another question? No, go ahead, Dawn. Sorry, I just, I'm just... Your hand up, Chris. We'll go to the next. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Is it my turn or Chris? Yeah, go ahead, Dawn. Like okay, I'm just wondering, you said, um, Nick said that you actually buy produce from a wholesale in Bristol. I'm just wondering if, if you do that so that you can um, create a kind of more rounded um, offer so that people can buy most of their product from, produce from you that they need for the week or is it you trying to, are you trying to create um, a complete offer so that people can buy everything from you? This is a really good question. When we set up the Food Hub all those years ago, the people who set it up were very idealistic. We said we're only going to sell produce that's grown or produced within 15 miles of Stroud. And mm -hmm. that was that was really strong. And then a lot of people were, were using the food hub and saying, yeah, but, but I, I need bananas. My kids have to have bananas. I can't live without bananas. And if I'm going to the supermarket buy bananas, then I might as well buy everything else there. Yeah. Um, and we we then decided we, we needed to be more realistic about, you know, not everybody who uses a food hub is 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 a eco warrior. <laughs> we want it to be mainstream. We want it to be available to everybody. So we changed the principles of the food hub, and that's one of the things that's really strong in the Open Food Network is that we want each food hub to make its own decisions about what it sells and which produces it it, 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 it includes. And we now say that if the produce can be produced within 15 miles, we'd, we'd favour a local producer, but we do want to have a, a wide range of produce and a, as full a basket as possible so that people don't have to go to supermarkets. Um, and that's a local decision. And if you decide you want to sell, you know, anything from anywhere in the world, then you can do that through the Open Food Network. Um, and it is up to each hub to make its own decisions and to also make its decisions about how strict do you want to be about production standards. So we've got some standards that are based on organic standards, they're based on animal welfare um, uh, certification standards, but we don't require our producers to be organic and certified as long as they fit within our criteria. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to ask um, if any other food hubs have managed to sort of crack the um, equitable access to food for sort of um, low socioeconomic backgrounds. That's really interesting. Um, a lot of people pre-pandemic, we, we had an interesting split on the Open Food Network. There were some food banks using the Open Food Network to distribute surplus produce either surplus from local producers or surplus from supermarkets and using the Open Food Network to distribute that free of charge to people. And then there were food hubs that were primarily people who could afford to pay a bit more for local food um, because of their principles or whatever. What happened during the pandemic is a lot of people slipped into food poverty who hadn't been in food poverty before. Um, and we, we found a lot of the food hubs really changing the way they worked to address the needs of everybody in their community and doing that really effectively and um, making sure because the, the food hubs were embedded in their local community they knew the people who were struggling <clears throat> even if those people weren't asking for help they knew who was struggling <clears throat> so they were able to reach out to people and offer them a reduced price on their on their produce 
And the way they funded that was to say to other people, if you can afford to pay a bit more for your food, there is now an option to pay to pay an extra at checkout. There's the option to pay forward. So if you're buying a veg box for yourself, you can buy a veg box for a, a neighbour you haven't met yet. <laughs> and then the food hub would then have a bursary fund. It will be able to make produce available at a lower price for people who, who couldn't afford it. And we feel that that's a real step forward, that we think that food banks are a bit of a sticking blaster and that they perpetuate food poverty. This new model encourages the whole community to look after each other. And as people work their way out of food poverty, they then pay what they can afford for their food. So yeah, it's a much more uh, community-led response to, to food poverty. And we're, we're doing a lot of research around food dignity because people don't like to ask for, for for help with that sort of thing and how do we how do we make it easily accessible so people can take food free of charge without having to be seen to be doing that people can make a donation for food that they don't take without being seen that they're doing that and just trying to, to, to manage that Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> uh, just, to, just to add to that, Chris, I, I would say that uh, there's a sort of immediate needs. You know, the pandemic has sort of really shone a light on food security issues and things like that. But mm. there's a, a longer term game as well where we should sort of have a policy to get rid of all food banks, you know, because it's it's not, you know, it's not a good situation to be in an economy like ours and be dependent on food bank. And also to try and introduce healthy affordable local food into the food bank and the food chain because uh, often you know there's an assumption that you know cheap uh, imports of not new nutritious food you know and you know the issues you're dealing with in the public sector as well you know spends billions on not particularly nutritious food which goes into our schools into hospitals everywhere so it's, it's how we can influence that at a small level in trying to kind of create markets for local producers who sometimes have surpluses instead of people relying on, you know, things that are freighted from the other side of the world, particularly from a climate change aspect. Now, I think, um, you know, your immediate needs when you've got nothing in your pockets is food, you know, to put on the table. But I think we can introduce fresh, healthy, nutritious food alongside, you know, that and still make it affordable at a local level because we haven't got those overheads. So. So that it's not an either or, I think that's what I'm saying. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, Andrea, go ahead, please. Is, is there any way in, in the system to sort of uh, incorporate a, a huge amount of flexibility? I'm thinking again, because I'm in a rural area, a lot of people do grow a lot of their food here um, and often have a surplus. Um, some people may just want to give it away, which is fine, but some people may want to try and establish some sort of mini enterprise um, whereby they can sell their surplus produce. But obviously, because of growing seasonal produce um, and we're trying to encourage people to eat seasonal produce, is there any way of sort of incorporating that sort of model where um, a group of people who have got surplus can sell it through some some sort of um, online platform um, at some sort of hub. I don't know, I'm just making it up as I go along here, but it's just, it's something that's been discussed in this, in, in this area. And also the second part of the question is, um, I'm in an area which is principally um, sheep and beef and dairy. And um, if there's a, a, a food hub, it's, and people are ordering sort of 36 hours in advance or whatever. For vegetables, that's fine, kind of straightforward. But if you've got a farmer who's uh, producing sheep or beef, uh, lamb or beef, they can't sort of slaughter an animal at short notice. Um, and there's got to be some, some way of working that into the system, because that's another reason I was given by farmers, livestock farmers, that they don't sell locally is, um, is that people only want part of the sheep or they only want bits of cow. Um, it's, it's, it's overcoming that sort of barrier. It's, it's, not, it's more straightforward for fruit and vegetables and, and preserves and things like that. But for, for, for meat, um, it's a slightly more complex issue. 
yes is the answer to both of those questions. <laughs> uh, um, you, what, what the the whole point of the Urban Food Network is to build a better food system, and one one of the things we believe is that that's not the, that that we need to have lots of small scale producers and fewer massive um, agri tech farms. So I mentioned earlier that eighty we have eighty five producers selling through our food hub. Australia's quite a small town. Most of those producers are, are people who have a few apples in their back garden once a year. They are people with allotments who sell surplus from their allotments. And as long as they're only selling surplus, they're not primarily a market garden. They're, they're mainly growing for their own use, but they get you know too many courgettes and too many runner beans. They sell through the food hub. Um, we have people who enjoy making jam and they do it as a hobby, but then they start to realize that people like their jam and they start to make a few extra jars. And then they, <clears throat> it's so popular that they start to employ somebody to work with them to make jam. And then they take on a, a unit and, and, and suddenly they find themselves being a food producer when they didn't really expect to be doing that. And we end up with a, a very rich network of, of, of very small scale producers. That is exactly what the Open Food Network is set up to do. And it's designed so that people can say, Yes, I've got runner beans available, but I've only got a, a kilo and a half this week. And when those have sold, it automatically comes offline. So it's very easy for people to sell small quantities. Uh, the meat thing, um, yes, we have quite a lot of meat producers who are farmers and farmers with, with stock. And what they do is they, they pre-sell. They'll set up what we call an order cycle. And an order cycle is a period during which the shopper or the buyer is placing an order for delivery or collection at a particular time. And they set up an order cycle way in advance. So they'll know that they're gonna sort slaughter, you know, five sheep at the end of November. They'll open their order cycle in September even, and they'll start taking orders for that meat. So that when, when, the, when the animals go off to the abattoir, they know that they've got pre-orders prepaid for to go out to those, to those um, shoppers. And quite often there'll be boxes, there'll be meat boxes, so you can't just buy the, the leg of lamb, you have to buy, you know, the, 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 the four quarters as well as the, the hind quarters. Um, with, with the option for people to pay, you know, for individual joints if they want to, so there's lots of flexibility within the system for the, for the people who are running the food hub to be selling local produce on a weekly basis but also taking orders pre-orders for meat that will be slaughtered sometime in the future also taking orders for christmas so there's quite a lot of food hubs now who've got a weekly order cycle but they're also starting to take you know orders for christmas turkeys and uh, um, you know christmas puddings and christmas cakes and that sort of thing but they won't be ready until the end of december so yeah that is exactly what we're set up to do Sorry, I'm on mute. Did that answer everything for you, Andrea? It did, thank you very much, yes. Great. Okay, uh, Dawn, I, I believe you had your hand up first. Please go ahead. Yes, um, I just wondering, um, in all cases, that do the suppliers package the food? Uh, not in all cases. Um, some food hubs, certainly our food hub insists on that. Um, because we've got quite a small space and we've got a large number of orders in quite a short period of time because we've only got the church hall for a certain number of time, a certain number of hours. So we do require all of our producers to pre-pack. So if we, if we send them an order for 20 lots of half kilo runner beans, we don't expect to get 10 kilos of runner beans in a bag that we then have to weigh out into 20 half kilos. We want that ready to go. Some food hubs are flexible and they will say to producers we really want your produce if you can only deliver a 10 kilo sack of runner beans then we will find somebody who will bag them up for you again that's a local decision that you okay yeah all right thanks cool um alice please go ahead hello um so i think i i'm on the i'm on the board of the grange pavilion so we are like a community group and and so we don't have the producers yet but we were looking into this to become a place where a food app could be hosted but 
we are, I guess, lacking the, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it'll be difficult in Cardiff really to, um, to get the producers and to get this going, but I just wanted to ask from an application point of view, what kind of things do we need in place to be able to apply for this, considering that we are a couple of steps behind, I think, everybody else in this call. So you need to think about where you will, do you have a venue? Do you have a place where you could do the, the processing of the, of the orders? Um, we use a church hall, schools are really, schools are really good at this kind of thing, particularly at weekends, schools aren't being used. And the extended schools curriculum is all about the school premises being used by the community outside of school hours. So quite a lot of food hubs are out of school, uh, use the school premises. Um, so you need to be thinking about that soon. Um, ideally, if, if you haven't got that in progress, at least in your application, you know, give us an idea of some of the possible venues that you might be approaching. Um, ideally, um, have a chat with them, make sure that they're, they're up for it, get an idea of what the cost would be if, if you need to hire that space. Um, you also need to think about other local businesses that would be affected by this. Quite often, other shops in the area, other markets in the area, other farmers markets, if you've got a community supported agriculture project in your area, some of these projects can feel threatened if you're starting to set up a food hub, you know, are you going to take business away from, from us? So you might want to be thinking about those other, other enterprises. The reality is that a food hub can actually benefit all of these businesses. Um, the food hub can uh, link with them and sell their produce online and, and make an income for them by selling their produce. Uh, the food hub can have the can offer them the option of being a pickup point so that people will come to their premises to, to collect pre-ordered produce and that will increase footfall into their into their businesses. So it can actually be quite a creative connection with other enterprises. But it's definitely worth thinking about who else is in your area. You might want to think about who's going to do the work of running the food hub. Um, it is several hours a week. Um, actually doing the, the sort and then there's online work you know building the producer network linking with shoppers possibly doing phone buddy work phoning producers and phoning shoppers um, um, those are the key things I think that you need to think about in advance but please if if you're thinking about setting the food hub do put in an initial application the initial application is really really easy you can do it in 10 minutes I think um, and anybody who puts in an initial application will be supported by the Open Food Network to, to explore their idea and to, to set something up. Only five projects will go through to the final stage and get the funding and get the full support and get the mentoring and so on. But the Open Food Network does have a, a very um, extensive set of resources to support anybody in Wales who wants to set up any kind of food hub. So please do put in an application. Um. I wonder if I can just very briefly talk about the application process as well, just to make sure everybody's um, totally clear on that. Um, at the moment, we are just asking for um, people to fill in an expression of interest. And that is the form that you will see on the um, Resilient Green Spaces page on the Open Food Network website. That's, that's just us gathering. What we don't want to do is ask people for loads of information up front, take up loads of their time and then find out that they're probably not going to be right to be going through to the five hubs that we will be supporting. Um, as Nick said, everybody who does apply to, with the expression of interest form, Open Food Net will be able to support them in whatever capacity, but it's just that you won't, you may not get onto that final um, five shortlist. So um, we're taking expressions of interest at the moment. As Nick said, it's, it's a really quick form. There's a couple of um, eligibility factors we need to, um, sort of tick the boxes for, you need to be based in Wales, you need to be a not-for-profit. Um, so um, you need to be willing to be um, involved in ongoing evaluation. Um, obviously it's a funded project, so we will be um, asking you to give us feedback and give us input. Um, so we are asking everybody to try and get that information, the expression of interest form filled in by the 1st of December. Um, when people have filled in that form and if we feel like they're a good candidate we will then send you an email and send you a link to this stage two form 
this has a lot, um, this goes into a lot more depth. So, um, I mean, at this stage, Alice, that asked for if you have a business plan, please upload it. You don't have to have a business plan, um, but sort of information like that will really help. Um, and we ask for a lot more in-depth information um, and then we will be sort of taking that information to a panel and we will be making a decision in January um, of who will be um, taking forward. Um, and we ask that those second stage forms are submitted by the 31st of December. Um, I mean, you don't have to be an established food hub to apply. Um, you, we're, we're, we're sort of asking for applications from, from new and existing. If you've got a really good idea, and if you've got you know, ideas for the infrastructure um, that you think could make happen, and you, maybe you need the support or you need the budget to make that happen, that's exactly what this project is for. Um, but it's also there for people who are up and running, but just need a little bit of extra help um, to really make it to the, to the sort of next stage. Um, so yeah, so that, I just wanted to sort of run through that again so everybody's clear on that process. Um, okay, I think Lisa, you had a question, please go ahead. Um, yeah, more of a kind of um, introduction to Alice, um, really, based on uh, Alice just expressing an interest in Grange Pavilion, putting in an application. Um, and I know that some people will be aware of who I am and what my job is and others aren't. Um, so I run the Edible Cardiff Network, which is aiming to connect up all community growing projects, allotments, food distribution centres across Wales. And we are currently working on a plot to pantry project which is then going to develop into a food hub application um, so I know Nick, Joe, Kat, I know various people on here are aware that Edible Cardiff will be supporting a community group to be putting in an application and we're currently talking to various ones across the city um, so I just wanted to mention to Alice that I'm going to drop her a, a quick message because I think it's important that we talk rather than put in um, competing applications and not considering groups that are interested that we didn't realise were interested and we have got existing connections with Grange Pavilion as well um, so I just wanted to kind of put my hands up and just say um, Edible Cardiff is there and we want to work with groups in Cardiff to make sure that everyone is getting what they want to out of any potential application and we're not doing things that you know aren't connected up um, so I'm going to drop my uh, email address in the chat for anybody who's in or around Cardiff that wants to get in touch and um, I'll also drop Alice a, a direct message as well, and um, we'll have a chat. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Nick, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on Lisa's point there um, about competing applications. Yes, if there are people in your area who you know are interested in this, this then please do you know, work together and put in an application together. But if what you want to do is to do two separate things and one maybe two very different food hubs don't feel that by putting in an application that you you can't do both um, so it may be that the, the the best thing for us to do from the funded project is to support one of those ideas and the other one should should be considered separately if it's considered separately, we will give you support still. There is a huge amount of resources within the Open Food Network in terms of building a food hub, marketing a food hub, getting it set up, all the financial management stuff. There's lots of resources on our page that you will have access to, whether or not you get the funding. So if, if there are two or more projects in your area that you think might be eligible, don't feel you have to shoehorn them into one application. Um, you could put in three separate applications. We will then talk to you and decide which of those three is the best to get the, the funding, but the other two will get other support. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, Abby, I see you put a question into chat. Are you? Is there anything else you'd like to add, or are you? Are you happy? You're happy. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, I don't, Tanya, I don't think there are any more questions. Have you come across any at all? No, there's no, no there's none been put in the chat apart from Lisa's um, contact details. Um, but there's no other questions in the chat, Jo. Great, thank you. Um, Nick, I wonder if you would like to um, just talk about Wendy's question. Wendy had to drop off at 10.15, but she did join a little bit earlier. We had quite an interesting chat with her. Do you want to just reiterate what was said there because I think there were some interesting points. Uh, I would I think it's a really good idea Joe and I can't remember what, what her question was can you remind me? Yeah, yeah of course it, it was around what the expectation is 
for hubs. Yeah. So what is the expectation in terms yeah. of what they need to achieve yeah. in the timeframes that are given? And um, do you remember what your answer was? I do, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need you to follow me around, Joe, and remind <laughs> me of conversations. Um, uh, yes. So when yes, when he was particularly concerned about would it be okay to apply, even though she wasn't sure whether the food hub would be fully up and running and fully viable by June 2023, and my response was that I would really encourage everyone to apply, whether or not they're concerned about whether it's a viable idea at this stage. Because going back to this point I keep making, this funding will support five food hubs with fund, with, with support and with capital and with um, salaries and so on. But everybody who applies will be, will be supported by the Open Food Network to take their idea forward. Um, so we do have certain targets that we as a, um, a group need to make and when I say we I mean the Open Food Network, DTA Wales and the Land Workers Alliance and Social Farms and Gardens who are the four partner organisations who are running this project and we need to make sure that we um, we support the food hubs through through this process. We will be learning as we go and we'll be writing up this learning and we will be preparing action packs that future food hubs in Wales will be using to, to, to learn from and we will learn as much from the things that don't work as the things that do work so if we if we do take on a, a food hub and we work with you and we and you have some pretty ambitious plans and we get 75 percent towards realizing those plans we'll be learning as much from the 25 percent that didn't work as we will from the 75 percent so please do apply and we will look very carefully at what you're trying to do we will definitely give you some support if we decide that you're a good candidate for the funded support then we will we will take you through the process but don't be held back by thinking that you're being too ambitious or that you haven't got enough time to do what you think you want to do um, we, we do encourage you to get stuck in and we will give you the most appropriate support we can was that what i said joe or did i say anything yeah that was great thank you, yeah, thank you. um and also um, on the on the website that we've set up, there's a lot of information and there is information about the eligibility criteria. Um, so um, I'll just oh, let's see if I can just really quickly share my screen and show you. Yeah, so um, the information about applying for the package, um, we've got the, the criteria that they need to sort of come up against. Um, and we've got some examples of people who might like to apply. So, uh, as I say, sort of, I'm not trying to put anybody off and saying you have to tick all these boxes, but there is criteria that we're marking people against. But but please do apply if you're thinking of applying and sort of let us do the work of looking through and deciding if we feel like um, we'll take you through to the five or if we'll just support you where you are at the moment. Um, Andrea, do you have another question? Yeah, I noticed that one of the criteria is preference given to um, urban and peri-urban um, communities having uh, problems accessing local food. Um, I'm in a rural area. Um, my nearest town, well, it depends on how you count a town and how you count a village, it's somewhere between the two. Um, has incredibly limited access to food full stop. People have to there, there are there are there is a, a, a local supermarket which is horrendously expensive and quite poor quality um, and so the nearest access to food if you like is um, 15 to 18 miles away which is probably a lot further <laughs> than um, a lot of peri-urban and urban areas so I feel a little disturbed by the fact that preference will be given to urban and peri-urban because there are people who live in the town who don't have a garden. Um, there's an awful lot of food poverty. There's a lot of social issues. And I think to say that preference is given to urban and peri-urban regions is really um, a bit disturbing. Um, there are as many issues to do with um, access to food and food deserts in rural areas, <laughs> silly as it sounds, as there are in 
urban and peri-urban areas. So I don't, I think that criteria really is a bit misleading. <laughs> Yes. Does anybody want to pick up on Andrea's point? I, I would say um, the information you've just given us is is really useful. Please put that in your application. Um, we're not saying that we are only supporting people in uh, urban and peri-urban. Um, I think we're just trying to encourage people from those areas to apply. Um, it's sort of one of the criteria that came from Welsh Government and we sort of want to honour that. But that's not to say we won't fund, uh, we won't support people in um, in rural rural areas. So, so please, please do apply and please put all that information into your application form, which you will find in the stage in the stage two one. There probably isn't a space in stage one um, to add much of that information, but if you can, please do. Um, but but if it, when it comes to us sending you the stage two form, there definitely will be an opportunity to put all that information in there, and we will absolutely take all that in, on board because. You know, every every area is different. Every area has has its own um, nuances, and we want to know uh, about what what there is available in your area and, and how we come to help. I, th I think Anne Marie wanted to come in there, Joe. Sure, go for it, Anne Marie. I was just really going to thank Joe for a great answer. <laughs> Um, I was just going to really reiterate that it when the when the funds were applied for that was the the, the background to the application is that urban peri urban focus that the definition can be, you know it and community uh, and green spaces attached to communities so I would absolutely back up what Joe said please apply please let's get that information we can. Anything that's gained, any information that's gained, we can use that when we report back to Welsh Government as well. Um, so, yeah, please don't let that stop me from applying. I noticed that Peter unmuted as well. Did you want to add to that, Peter, or is that...? Yeah, no, uh, no I think Joe hit it on the button, actually. Yeah. It's yeah. not a criteria that we as a group have set. It's come from the funders through the European funded programme. but. Again, I don't think it's, it's exclusively uh, um, urban or peri-urban areas. That's the main sort of uh, targets of the overall programme, you know. So, as you said, you know, that shouldn't stop you applying. And as Nick said, you could get support anyhow, even if you were at a very early stage of this uh, a concept of bringing all these different people together to address a particular issue in your area, which you described very well, then you should put in that EOI. For starters, anyhow. And just just to add to that, when when you do set up your food hub, it sounds like your local village, your local town, will be a really important source of customers. And what you might want to think about with your food hub, and if you do decide to put in a, a second stage application, you might want to think about well, could we have pickup points in that town and could the main customer base come from that town, even though you're in a quite a rural area and most of the producers will be in a rural area? Can you find some way of getting these boxes of produce into that town, maybe dropping them off at a, at a church hall, maybe at a school hall, maybe at a shop, in the, uh, maybe there's, there's people who have a shed in their back garden where they could be a pickup point and you could have different collection points around the town. So that might be a way of tapping into that urban area yeah, i think i mean that that will be i've got ideas of venues um venues are not going to be a problem <laughs> um does anyone else have any questions any more questions at all i can't see anything in the chat and we've got sorry go ahead No, false alarm. Um, okay, um, we've got sort of four minutes left. Do any of the partners want to add anything else? Is there anything, any other comments you'd like just, to make? Just really obvious things in case people miss it. You know, you have to be a not for private profit uh, organization to apply for this fund, you know, because, but that doesn't exclude. You know, private enterprises, local business being involved in a wider network in exactly the way that Nick has described and Joe's described. Uh, 
it, just in case you miss it on the website, but it's the 1st of December, isn't it, for the EOIs and the 31st yeah. for the uh, full applications. And it doesn't mean only five go through to the second stage. It, it, we could get multiple applications go, going through the basic EOI eligibility checks, but it's at the final stage in January, isn't it, when decisions will be made around the five hubs to support. And if it's a very advanced hub that's already got lots of funding and finance coming in, and then you, you might be surprised at why you didn't get selected at the end of the process. It might be because you felt that the investment would better go to another hub where they hadn't got that sort of access to resources, you know. So, so apply at all stages of development, including existing organisations that might have been going a long time but want to then grow a food hub on the back of you or a brand new idea in the way that Andrea described a sort of startup. It's just an aspiration, but an ambitious and innovative enterprise, in um, one I would say. Yes, um, and just to follow on from that point with the timings, um, we would like to get the, the, the five hubs chosen by the end of January um, 2022. Um, we, we actually haven't got very long to sort of support you, even though June 2023 feels like a long time away, the time will go very quickly. And we would like to start um, funding the hubs really quickly. So we'd actually like to start funding the hubs in sort of February, March next year. Um, so, so we are planning to move very quickly um, as soon as we've got the five hubs approved. So just to make everybody aware, um, we won't be sort of sitting around. We're going to be trying to get you up and running as quickly as we can. Just uh, add to Peter's point about uh, not for private profit. So. That's again the criteria of this funding um, that the, the hub itself needs to be not for private profit, even though some of the partner organizations may, will be you know, private farms, private uh, enterprises. Um, many of the food hubs on the open food network are for private profit, so it, it is not an open food network criteria. So if you are thinking of setting up a food hub and you are um, a profit making organization, please do approach us. Um, you could fill in the OI, you won't get through to the second stage, but at least we've got your contact details. Or just contact us and let us know, and we will provide the full Open Food Network support to any organisation that wants to set up a local food enterprise, regardless of their governance structure. And also just to say, Joe, as, as you've been saying the, the whole way through, um, apply, Joe's Joe, Joe's put the resilient green spaces at openfoodnetwork.org.uk email in for any questions about the food hubs. I've put my email in for any questions about resilient green spaces. Lisa's put her email in for uh, those uh, organisations in, in, uh, in and around Cardiff. Um, and we, there's other food, there's other support projects going on for other organisations. So do use those emails, do get in touch with us prior to applying, as you're applying, there is lots of different support out there for different kinds of groups and we will absolutely all work together to try and get you the support that you need for whatever stage that you're at. There's a question from Abby, Joe. Yeah, um, is it in chat or? No, I think she's got a hand. Go ahead, Sorry. Abby. I'll be super quick. Sorry if you covered this. Um, the 2.5 days for the role, is that going to be a set amount, the same for each member of staff in each, well, each hub? And is that shared with them before the application, the amounts of the salary, sorry? So it is a set amount. Um, it is going to be the same for each of the hubs. Um, so, yes, we can... Um, I'm not sure how much that information is going to be shared, Anne Marie. You might. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, can I share the sort of rough amount per quarter that we think it will be? Yes, yeah, so that will be about two thousand pounds per quarter um, for that number of staff for each hub. Thank you. Okay, I think that's everything. Um, sorry, I did want to say one more thing, and that when if people get through to second stage, which I think most people will, it's it's not sort of difficult to get through to second stage. We will, tr um, we would love to have a chat with you, um, sort of one on one with your organisation, the partners. So um, please do bear that in mind. I will sort of be emailing you and hounding you, trying to get a meeting in the diary with you, so we can talk to you while you're putting your application in. Um, okay, well we're one minute past eleven. <laughs> We've done very well on time, so well done, everybody. Um, 
I we will be updating the website with we will put this recording onto the onto the web page. Um, and um, yeah, any any questions, please do get in touch. We are here. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to talk to you. Um, but yeah, make sure you get your first stage applications in by the first of December, please. Um, yeah. Any any other thoughts? Anything from any of the partners? No. Great. Okay. Good. Well. Have a great day, everybody, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to talking to you. Yeah, good luck, everyone. Thanks Looking forward then. to working with you. Cheers, Thank everybody. You. Bye, bye. 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 Thanks a lot. Bye. Great. And then there were four. <laughs> Shall we stop the recording, Joe? Yes. Well done, Nick.